It's great to be here again, and it's, uh, it's just a real pleasure to talk a little bit more, uh, more about our company and the progress we're making towards becoming a major ophthalmic pharmaceutical company. Before I do that, I do want to thank the team for recognizing not only Allergan, but Gavin in particular, because many of us wouldn't be working today in ophthalmology had it not been for his contribution. So again, thank you for doing that. So our company has, while it's only been around for 11 years or so, we're making great progress in terms of what we're doing in the pipeline. And so we're building a major ophthalmic pharmaceutical company on the basis of two products initially. The first one is Ropressa, which is a uh, rokinase inhibitor that treats uh, the underlying tissue, the trabecular meshwork, that causes the increase in the elevated uh, intraocular pressure. And so Ropressa has already um, completed all of its clinical trials. We filed the NDA in the month of September. And as you can imagine, for a small baby company like ours, that's a huge undertaking. And at the same time, we took the product Ropressa, added it to Latanoprost, all in one bottle, and were able to move forward with the results of the first of the phase three clinical trials for Roclitan, called Mercury One, and we had very, very successful data there. And I'll share that with you in just a second. But we're also building the pipeline. It's not, we're not gonna rest on these two products. You know, we think we can turn profitable pretty quickly after we launch you know, sometime in the 2018 or so time frame. And so we wanna make sure we take the opportunity now to build that pipeline. And it's built not only on what we're doing with Ropressa, but some of the other molecules and drug delivery systems, et cetera, that we're looking at. So example, for Ropressa, not only are we looking for things like disease modification, antifibrotic effect, et cetera, but we're also doing a lot of probe studies. Like, for example, we just got data showing how well our drug works when the patient's asleep. And so nighttime control of intraocular pressure has become critical, I think, in the treatment of these kinds of patients. So when I turn to just Ropressa in the clinical trials we did, the first set was Ropressa for non-inferiority versus Timolol for the approval that, that we're seeking in terms of the treatment of uh, intra elevated intraocular pressure and glaucoma. We conducted two trials in the United States, the labels Rocket 1 and Rocket 2. They both had uh, uh, efficacy at below 25 millimeters of mercury. We were non-inferior, which is what we were trying to achieve. This is very classic design. It's, uh, the FDA, thank God, has been very consistent in terms of the guidance they provided on how to get a drug approved in this category. And if you look, uh, the, uh, the, uh, their preferred approach is clearly using an active comparator, and we use Timolol. Uh, so again, Rocket 2 and Rocket 1 served as a basis for that. One of the interesting things that we found was that not only were we effective at being non-inferior, but we also worked out over 12 months. So we actually take a look at those patients on the safety side of Rocket 2, because we had not only 90-day efficacy, but also the long-term safety component, and we were able to hold the 8 a.m. intraocular pressure pretty consistently. And just to show the validity of the work that we did, we also looked at what happened to Timolol over that time frame. And as many of you practicing clinicians out there know, Timolol does lose efficacy over time, and it certainly did that in this particular clinical trial. So when I turn to Roclitan, the combination, um, we really have to do two very different clinical trials relative to what we did with Repressa. Here, as Wiley talked about this morning, we have to go do uh, superiority of the combination versus each individual component. So Roclitan versus Ropressa and then Latanoprost. And so we're doing that in the US, and I'll talk about the results in just a second. But also in Europe, we're doing a combination trial of Roclitan versus a well-known combination already approved in that marketplace. And so we're undertaking the work to get that done and move the products there, both Ropressa and Roclitan, to approval in Europe. So for Mercury One, the, the trial design was relatively straightforward, showing superiority of the combination over each individual component. We wanted to make sure that we had statistical significance at all the time points that we studied, but also we wanted to show that one to three millimeters of mercury improvement, which really talked about the, you know, the clinical relevance of the data. We wanted to make sure that we showed the contributory effect of Ropressa when it was added to Latanoprost. And so we worked through all the statistics with the FDA. We were able to move forward with that. And these are the results that we just recently showed. You could see that we brought the patients in, they were under some sort of medication or they were naive patients, extreme left-hand column. We washed them out like you normally would do in these kinds of trials. And then we brought them back at the end of week two, end of week six, and on the 90th day, and each time we brought them back, we measured the, uh, their intraocular pressure at 8, 10, and 4 p.m. And so as you could see, there was a great separation between the combination and each of the individual components, which is exactly what we were hoping to do so we reached not only statistical significance, but we were able to show quite a bit of separation in terms of the absolute pressure between the combination and each of the individual components. 
One of the most exciting things for us, though, is when we turn to the responder analysis, because we wanted to see what the real-life contribution of our drug was going to be when it was added to latanoprost. And here we took the cuts in looking at the, the percent reduction first, and then we also looked at the actual millimeters reduction that we received by looking at the combination. If you take a look at the, at the box that we've outlined, you, about two-thirds of the patients who were on Roclitan got the pressures below 16 millimeters of mercury and starting off somewhere in the mid-20s. As compared to not quite 40% of the patients who were on latanoprost for that same pressure drop. And so basically what we're showing there is the contribution that Repressa provided to latanoprost in all these patients. And if you go to the extreme left-hand side, we had about a third of the patients actually get the pressures of below 14, and probably over half of those patients were in single-digit kind of pressures. And so these are the kinds of pressures that I'm told by uh, RCMO that we only see those whenever we have actual uh, surgery on some of these patients. So we're very, very pleased with the contributory effect that we were able to show with Repressa versus latanoprost. So in summary, we were able to show the statistical significance. We showed the one to three millimeters of mercury. We did have the, trip, the traditional adverse events we expect to see uh, of the redness because the, the drug is a vasodilator, so we saw quite a bit of redness in some of the patients, but relative to the prostaglandins, uh, it's not dramatically different than those. Um, and so, and we didn't see any drug-related uh, serious adverse events or, or no systemic adverse event. So again, we feel pretty good about the profile of, of Roclitan. So our next steps are to complete Mercury 1. We've got a safety component added to it. We've got Mercury 2 that's already in the clinic. We expect the results here in the second half, I'm sorry, in the first half of next year. And hopefully that'll allow us to move towards an NDA submission for Roclitan towards the end of the year. One of the interesting components of uh, this particular study is we looked at the, the performance of Ropressa relative to latanoprost. And what was amazing is when we look at an open-ended pressures like we did here, we were actually non-inferior to latanoprost at below 25 millimeters of mercury. So again, it's showing the continued utility of, of the product like Ropressa in treating those patients at below 25. So in summary, our cl clinical performance and, and our priorities continues to be the, the focus of the company. We're trying to get Repressa through the FDA now that we have the NDA filed. As many of you know, that's not a straight path. And so we expect the full roller coaster ride like everybody else has always done. We'll move forward with Rakuten as quickly as we can right behind it. We've got a number of research initiatives, not only for the front of the eye, for the back of the eye. And we'll continue looking at our business opportunities in terms of business development, but also we're keeping the rights for Europe and we're considering doing the same thing for Japan. We're expecting that we'll go ahead and do all the clinical work in both Europe and probably over the next few months when we go back to visit with the PMDA, we may, we may make the decision to do the clinical studies on ourselves in Japan. So nice thing is uh, we took advantage of our stock uh, running up and doubling over the last month or so, and we're now fully financed. We'll end up this quarter with roughly a quarter of a billion dollars, which allows us to do everything that we need to do, including building the sales force so that we can hopefully launch this product in sometime in 2018. One of the things we're most proud of is this is the actual uh, milestones that we laid out during the S1 or during our IPO back in 2013, and we've been able to achieve every one of those. And so it's been a busy uh, three years for us as a public company, and certainly, you know, I wish that all of us could have the kind of month that we had in September where we filed an NDA and had great results for our last phase three trial. So thank you. Mm -hmm.